Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited that today we have Ian Rowe here from the American Enterprise Institute and from Vertex Partnership Academies. Not only is he working to help us understand what leads to upward mobility, but he's directly impacting upward mobility of students that are from disadvantaged backgrounds through his charter schools in New York City. Uh, I know we have a really good crowd up here in the Louise, and you'll get a chance to ask your own questions after our conversation. So please start getting your questions ready. I know we also have a good audience on Zoom as well. Ian Rowe is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation, and adoption. Mr. Rowe is also co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools inaugurated in the Bronx in 2022. The chairman of the board of Spence Chapin, a nonprofit adoption services organization, and the co-founder of the National Summer School Initiative. He concurrently serves as a senior fellow at the Woodson Center and a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. Mr. Rowe was CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of public charter schools based in the South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan for a decade. Before joining Public Prep, he was Deputy Director of Post-Secondary Success at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Public Affairs at MTV, Director of Strategy and Performance Measurement at USA Freedom Corps office in the White House, and Co-Founder and President of Third Millennium Media. Mr. Rowe also joined Teach for America in its early days. So as you can see, he has a very oh, extensive good. resume. Exhausting. Uh, <laughs> he's been widely published in the popular press, including the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Examiner. He's often interviewed on talk radio programs. And he has a book, Agency, which hopefully all of you have a copy of now. Uh, I didn't ask if you would autograph them, but I'm guessing you'll autograph yeah, copies for, for sure. people. Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah, and so thank you to the Menard family and all of our donors for making this series possible. Really excited to hear from Ian today, and so welcome, Ian. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's everybody welcome Ian Rowe. Before we start talking about some of the things that you do at Vertex Partnership Academies, I think it'd be really good to hear a little bit of your background. You have a very inspirational story. Um, your parents immigrated to the United States from Jamaica uh, in search of opportunity. And I'm wondering yeah. if you could talk a little bit about what did you learn from your parents, maybe your parents' story, yeah. and how it's inspired you to really dedicate your life yeah. to upward mobility? Wow. Well, uh, well, again, first of all, thank you for uh, having me. I look forward to uh, Q&A and, and really just getting into some of these um, discussions, especially at this time in our country where I think so many of us are looking for better answers for how young people of all backgrounds uh, find their way uh, to the American dream. Because uh, I think a lot of young people are, are, are feeling somehow that it's um, slipping uh, from their grasp. And I think we as the grown-ups have to let young people know that there are still pathways uh, to success and that there, really, there are some very important institutions that can help them get there. Uh, in terms of my own parents, yes, uh, my parents were both uh, born in Jamaica, West Indies. Uh, they grew up there. Um, uh, they started courting uh, each other uh, in the uh, mid-1950s. Uh, uh, this was in the country, in Jamaica. My, my, uh, my dad used to pick up my mom on horseback uh, for their dates, which is, which is really lovely. Um, and, my, and my dad, actually, he, um, uh, Jamaica at the time was an English commonwealth, and so my dad felt that he had reached uh, his highest level of education that he could achieve in Jamaica, so he went to England uh, by himself. What he, had, he and my mom had, had uh, started dating, um, but he ultimately felt he had to go to England to pursue his education. And uh, a few months after getting to England, he wrote, uh, at that time uh, in England, if you wanted to uh, marry someone you know, under 21, uh, you had to write uh, uh, to the parents for their hand in marriage. 
so he wrote uh, what he often says was the letter of a lifetime, where he wrote a letter um, from England, sent it to my mom's parents in Jamaica, asking for her hand in marriage. And, um, and my mom always regret, like we, we, we don't have that letter. <laughs> that, it's like one of the regrets of um, one thing that wasn't saved, but uh, she, um, you know, she, it was, a, it was a big thing, obviously, in the Roe household, or at that time, the Sivrite household, um, whether or not she was going to go to England. And uh, her parents and her sisters, they all ultimately said yes, because they knew Vincent. And so my mom, at 19 years old, uh, took a boat all by herself uh, to England. And, and so they, they got married, they started their life in London, and they had my brother, and then they had me. Um, but then ultimately, they came to the United States. This was in the, uh, 1968. Uh, and that was, if you remember, 1968 was a pretty tumultuous year uh, in the United States, particularly around issues of race. Uh, there was a lot of racial tension, there were riots throughout the country. But my parents felt that even in the midst of all that, they felt that the country was changing. You know, the, the Civil Rights Act had passed, the Voting Rights Act um, had passed, and so they looked at America as a place of opportunity. Um, the key was, would you be prepared? And my dad was always, you know, are you prepared? Like this, you know, so they, they had no um, uh, misconceptions of some of the challenges we would face in the United States, being a black family moving to the United States, but they, but they felt that, that that risk or concern paled relative to the opportunity that existed in the country. Um, and there's no question that my parents' attitude around things like the importance of family, the importance of faith, uh, the importance of a strong education, those were the institutions that mattered far more than the aspect of race. Um, uh, would be, even if that represented a negative force, these other forces uh, would be far more powerful in determining whether or not we would be successful. So, I mean, I, 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 have, I have lots of stories I can share where how that played out, but that's, foundationally, there's no question that my parents' kind of um, adventure, you know, the sense of adventure, the sense that they could do this together, um, and they, my parents were married for 48 years. Uh, they were, unfortunately both now have passed away. But the model that they set for me, uh, no question, influences a lot of my work today. Awesome. And I've also seen you talk about how your mom, for her to ask her parents to, to get married, she was expressing agency really. I right. realized that maybe for the first time. And so, yeah. Um, a, a, you know, everyone has the book Agency, and yep. I know a lot of what you do is yep. stressing, you know, teaching kids to have agency. Yep. So could you just talk a little bit about how you define agency and how it might be different than other people will define it? Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll continue the story, because, yeah, my mom, you know, at, at 19, you know, are you going to take a 5,000-mile journey to be with this guy? Yes, you've met them, but that was a big deal. This was the mid-1950s. <laughs> it's, it's not something that was commonly done. Uh, and I have, it's not, a, it's not the exact uh, parallel, but when we had first uh, moved to the United States, we lived in Brooklyn, uh, and then we ultimately moved to Queens, and I was going to a junior high school, 231, and um, uh, we moved to a small town called Laurelton, Queens, uh, which at the time was predominantly um, uh, Italian, uh, Jewish, community, predominantly white, and it was slowly becoming more racially uh, integrated because more black uh, families were moving in. And unfortunately, that did lead to um, uh, racial tension. And my junior high school was basically the epicenter of a lot of these incidents. Um, and, uh, but I still love my school, right? But the, the, the school board, our local school board, decided that the way to solve this problem was to create an annex to open another junior high school. Now, this would be in Rosedale, so a town a couple of miles over, but in a, in a part of Queens that was uh, predominantly white. 
And what occurred was all of the white parents in our school uh, decided to take their kids out and send them to this annex, leaving junior high school 231 as you know, basically a, a segregated, all black school. And my parents, who'd come to this country for the American dream on the premise that, well, where the white kids go, that must mean that's where the better education is, that's where they were gonna send me as well. And uh, you know, I was 12, and um, I never did anything against my parents' wishes, right? And uh, I mean, they would crawl through broken glass uh, for my brother and I if they thought that that was the right thing to do. But something about leaving the school um, just seemed wrong, right? I loved my school, I loved my teachers. Like, why, just because of who's left there? Does it have to be automatically you know, a bad school? Why is it automatically better over there? And I just, I, you know, I, 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 and I'll always remember the Sunday night before uh, we were, had to sign the transfer papers, um, begging my parents uh, for me to stay at our school. And, um, and this was, I had never challenged my parents on anything, so I cried, I pleaded. And they ultimately uh, decided to let me stay. And it was this amazing moment because I felt invested in a way that I'd never felt in my own life on anything, right? I had, I had skin in the game. I, had, I said to my parents, I promise I'll work hard. Believe in me, believe in me. Um, and they acquiesced and so they let me stay. And I do think maybe a kernel that one of the reasons my mom may have, because she was the first one to say yes, but um, that she had had that moment years earlier when she was asking her parents, you know, on an even a more momentous decision, right? But this idea that in that moment, I think that's the first time I experienced what I would now call agency. Like I, I had a sense that. I was invested in my own future. Like I helped shape this outcome for my own life. And I mean, it was a daunting feeling. I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't remember exactly, but I think I remember this feeling of like, okay, I guess I'm on, you know? <laughs> like I, I fought for this, my parents said yes, against their best interest, against what they believed was right because they believed in me so I had added responsibility to make this the right decision, you know? And um, so now I run schools in, in many ways because I want every kid, regardless of background, to have a similar, a similar experience, right? A similar turning point, uh, the, that, that moment of agency um, or, or your coming of agency moment. Um, that you know that you can be the architect of your own life, right? That you can become master of your own destiny, especially if you've got great supports, like in this case, my parents and everything that they were willing uh, to do for me. So I define agency um, as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment, right? The force of your free will guided by moral discernment, right? So all of us as human beings, we have free will, right? We have the, we have the ability to make decisions, um, <laughs> but there are lots of people who have free will that do bad things, right? So the question is, how do you exercise your free will, right? So you think of agency like a vector or, or, or velocity where velocity is not just speed, it's speed and direction, right? So how do young people learn in what direction they should exercise their free will? And that's why in my book, I do create a framework called Free, Family, Religion, Education, and Entrepreneurship. And we can go through each one, but those are the, the four pillars I think if more young people were to understand the power of each one of those institutions, it would uh, empower them to make the kinds of decisions to exercise their free will or their agency in a direction that's uplifting, that allows them to 
achieve their own uh, God-given potential. Um, so that's how I, that's how I, I define agency and, and sort of my own moment when I experienced what that felt. Yeah, awesome. And it sounds like there's also an additional sense of accountability as well because you, you made that decision and it's like, it, I better make sure that yes. I, I, it's the right decision. In well, way. what is it? In the words of uh, Peter Parker, you know, Spider-Man fans, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And so if you have, if you have uh, control over your life, if you're um, making big decisions, there should be a sense of accountability. Like I own, you know, I am responsible. And we're going to talk later about um, the four cardinal virtues that we uh, speak about at our school, at our high school in the Bronx, but temperance, you know, I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and behavior. Like, you have to say those words out loud, you know? I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. If you say that enough times, you start to realize, wow, you know, like, it's on me. That doesn't mean I'm, you know, pulling myself up by my own bootstraps or I'm all alone, but there is a sense of personal accountability, personal responsibility that's a necessary component of agency. So, yeah, so I think you've touched on a little bit of this, but I'd like to just hear a little bit more about Vertex Partnership Academies. And yeah. if you were to talk about it, like, what do we do different than other schools and, and what are the things that set you apart in terms of what you do? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, it, it, it wasn't always the case that I was going to run schools. I mean, my career, you, you, you talked about it. I studied um, computer science engineering at Cornell. I, um, I got my MBA from Harvard Business School. Like, <laughs> so running schools wasn't, um, you know, mo I'm sure most of your business school graduates aren't necessarily going into running schools. Um, so it was never, it was never uh, prescribed that way. Um, but when I was working at Anderson Consulting, which <laughs> you, you, you've, you've all probably never heard of, but Anderson Consulting um, used to be Arthur Anderson Accounting, and then again Arthur Anderson Consulting, then Anderson Consulting, and now it's Accenture. Some of you may be familiar with that uh, strategy firm. Um, in New York, I worked there for six years, and I was mentoring in public schools in New York City. So I went to, so I went to New York City public schools kindergarten through 12th grade. So I've benefited significantly from a great tuition-free public education. So I'm a big proponent of uh, public school uh, education. And, uh, and so when I was at, and then I went to Cornell, but then in between Cornell and business school, I was um, volunteering and tutoring kids in Queens, in Brooklyn, uh, and I just always remember thinking, like, there but for the grace of God go I. Like, here are these kids who either because of their zip code or maybe their family structure uh, just didn't have access to the same opportunities that I had. There was no, there literally, there was no, no difference in their capacity to be successful. And that just also just struck me as wrong. I mean, we live in an incredible country that has opportunity, but who cares if the opportunities are here if I'm here and I don't know how to access those or I'm not prepared to do so. So that's when I really started thinking about going into education. I went to business school with this idea of how could I take what I'd learned in the private sector uh, and apply that in the arena of, of um, public education. And that's where I discovered Teach for America. And again, I'm happy to go into all those. Uh, but over the course of about um, 20, 20 years, you know, I'd, I'd worked at the White House, the Gates Foundation, MTV. Um, I'd started my own company, Third Millennium Media. So I'd done a lot of interesting things in and around how to help young people in general um, get to the next level of their life. And um, I ultimately decided, you know, I needed to run schools. I mean, when I was at the Gates Foundation, we gave away $470 million in one year, you know, as a pilot. <laughs> um, it's so much money. And most of our grants were to um, high schools and community colleges that were trying to help uh, kids essentially uh, remediate issues that had originated in like elementary and middle school. 
you know, issues, you know, kids who are maybe going to college, but they weren't academically prepared, they weren't socially prepared, they weren't financially prepared. And I just realized, I mean, it's always important to try and solve a problem, but if you're trying to solve a problem at the end of the pipeline, at the end of education, and you're not being honest at looking at where these issues truly originate, then you're, then you're just doing Band-Aids. You're not um, really focused on the problem. So, that's what, so I started running uh, a network of elementary and middle schools in 2010, uh, and, I did, and I ran that for 10 years, and it was amazing, you know, pre-K through eighth grade, and, and again, we can talk about but that, but th that was in the Bronx, South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and you know, these were schools where uh, you know, we were doing pretty well. You know, each year we had maybe two to 300 uh, open uh, slots each year for our entry grades, like kindergarten or pre-K or at our middle schools, sixth grade, but there were only like two or 300 uh, open seats, and yet we were having nearly 5,000 families um, apply in our, in our random lottery. Uh, in New York and like most other places, uh, public charter schools, which are public schools, but um, managed uh, independently by nonprofit organizations like ours, um, they're typically oversubscribed, meaning that there's a lot of folk, you know, in this district where we just launched our high school, uh, of the 2,000 or so students that started ninth grade in the year 2015, four years later, only 7% graduated from high school ready for college, right? I mean, meaning that 93% of ninth graders started in 2015 and either dropped out somewhere along the way over the course of four years, or in 2019 they did earn their high school diploma, but still could not do math nor reading without remediation if they even were to go to college, just to give you a sense. And in New York, there's a cap, and there's a legislative barrier, meaning that if you wanted to start a new high school, in this community, you couldn't do it because there's literally this um, uh, ceiling uh, that's been set. And, and, and again, we can uh, uh, talk about that. So after running uh, Public Prep, this network of elementary and middle schools for 10 years in, uh, in, in 2020, you know, right at the time of COVID, I decided to launch a new network of what, what are actually, I know you said character-based, we've actually shifted that now to be a virtues-based um, high school. So organized around these four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. And these are, car these are called cardinal virtues because cardinal, uh, uh, the Latin uh, root cardo, which means hinge, right? And so these four cardinal virtues are foundational, meaning every other character-based strength is some expression of these four virtues. So that's why we've decided these are the four anchors of our school, and we do think that that's very different than most other schools. And uh, we opened our high school in 2022 uh, in the Bronx, uh, in, in, in what is, is definitely considered one of the lowest income um, community districts uh, in the country, so a very high poverty rate, very high rate of single parenthood. Um, and we actually took over an old Catholic school uh, campus that had closed uh, in 2013. It's actually where Justice Sonia Sotomayor, Supreme Court Justice, it's where she went to school. Uh, she went there kindergarten through eighth grade. She was the valedictorian. Um, and the other things that make the high school, the school unique, and, and we should definitely dive into the virtues and how we play those out, uh, we also, um, at the end of your sophomore year as a student, you have the option of choosing either what's called the International Baccalaureate Diploma Pathway or the International Baccalaureate Careers Pathway. The Diploma Pathway sets you, it's a very rigorous academic program that sets you up when you graduate from high school to be able to thrive in any top college or university in the country, if not the world, uh, or you can choose the International Baccalaureate Careers Pathway. And by the way, these are of equal stature. There's no sort of stepchild relationship. 
but during your junior and senior year, you can do uh, apprenticeships in high school. So imagine you might be able to uh, work uh, one day a week maybe um, in a New York City hospital uh, learning to become a phlebotomist, you know, learning how to take blood, for example. Or next year we're going to have a course, a course of study in computer science and cybersecurity. And imagine graduating from high school with a credential in cybersecurity. So if you choose to not go to college immediately, you would have the ability, you would have a credential with labor market value. Um, and it's, it's part of what we are trying to demonstrate that the secondary experience, you know, grades 9 through 12, doesn't always have to result in college as the only option. Um, and I think generally, we as a country, because not everyone, college is not necessarily the right answer for every kid immediately after high school. And there's a lot of data that says, especially for young boys, if they work for a, for a few years coming out of high school, um, they earn a little bit of money, maturity, responsibility, you know, far lower levels of interaction with the criminal justice system, um, uh, much lower levels of non-marital births, and then if they actually go back to school, much higher rates of college completion. So those are some of the things that we think are unique about what we're doing to build a new kind of institution in the Bronx. Because um, I, I think we're at a point in our country where we need more proof points of what actually works. Um, it just seems that we're at a time where a lot of folks are, are, are tearing down uh, institutions and like one of my colleagues at AEI often says, you know, it's a time to build. You know, it's a time to create the new kinds of institutions that we think have to endure uh, for our kids. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you think there's an opportunity to expand this type of model in, in other parts of the country? I mean, the, like I look at North Dakota, our biggest issue is attracting and retraining qualified labor and a lot of it is not getting workers that have experience, and so they can get this experience in high school. There's a need for the trades, not just in North Dakota, but yeah. everywhere. I mean, right, right. Um, do I think there's a way, a role for expansion? Yes, I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's really weird. So I've been in the, the, the world of education reform for, you know, I mean, in 20, 30 years, and we've always had political divisions in our country. Uh, but what really marked the education reform movement in the United States was that whether you were left or right, you know, liberal, progressive, or you know, conservative, whatever your disagreements were, when it came to education, there was this consensus that I think everyone agreed that equal access to a great education should be something that every, that, that, that should be something every kid should have. And so we could park our differences, and so you could really have bipartisan support around education reform. So things like public charter schools as an empowering alternative within the public school system, or vouchers, or education savings accounts, or you know anything that pushed power in the hands of parents to make a decision that they think could work for their kids. Well, in the last five to 10 years, that kind of implicit agreement among sides that were typically fighting, <laughs> that's kind of imploded um, in that uh, people who fight on the environment or in immigration or crime, they're now fighting on education. And so a lot of progress, in my view, has stalled on education reform. And so depending on the state that you're in, like Florida um, certainly is a, another example. Like, let's just take Florida versus New York. Like Florida is expanding uh, choice. Um, you know, expand, you know, they have scholarship programs that uh, you, you know, young people and families can take really advantage of. But like in New York, like literally yesterday, New York State announced that they're going to be moving towards eliminating the, what has been for a, a century the assessments that are typically required to demonstrate proficiency in math and reading in order to graduate 
from high school. You know, in the name of equity, you know, because they don't like the results that how kids are doing or certain groups of kids are doing on these assessments, rather than, okay, well, let's look at all the factors that are driving low performance, their answer is, well, let's just get rid of the assessments, right, which is crazy. Um, and so, and there are these caps on charter schools, right? So, uh, unfortunately, depending on where you are, really drives whether or not kids will have access to our type of education or any, or any other kind of education that parents uh, want. And this is especially true now post-COVID. You know, because during COVID, a lot of parents got greater visibility into what was happening in their kids' school, and they didn't always like it. And, you know, that all, COVID also coincided with the death of George Floyd. And so not only were lots of people home on Zoom taking school, they were also, you know, seeing lessons in quote unquote social justice that didn't always match up to what um, a lot of parents felt was necessary or what felt what, what they would like for their own child. And so we're at a precipice point, I think, uh, on this question of what is the future of education in our country and will parents have the opportunity to send their kids to uh, schools that they think is best for their child. I mean, imagine if you were in the Bronx, in our district, in which only 7% of kids graduate from high school ready for college, and you had no choice but to send your kid to a school that you know for generations has been producing these results. To me, it's, it's one of the most fundamental issues facing our country, and yet we seem to be obsessed with all sorts of other issues. So I, I'd like to be optimistic about your question. I mean, we certainly want to grow mm -hmm. uh, Vertex or, 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 or grow the environment in which a Vertex partnership academies could exist, but it's a real battle. I mean, we were sued. I mean, last bit, you know, when we opened in 2022, we were sued by the teachers union to try and shut us down even before we opened. Wait, wait, wait. we're launching a, a virtues-based school, an international baccalaureate model with these multiple pathways. This is a good thing, right? And uh, they would prefer to keep the stranglehold on growth of charter schools. And thankfully, we won. Mm -hmm. But it just gives you a sense of how hard it is uh, to create um, you know, positive educational opportunity for kids, especially in low-income communities. Yeah, I agree with you. It should be a bipartisan issue. And, and I thought I was optimistic with the, after the pandemic, it seemed like there was some progress in the direction of more school choice. But you're right, yesterday, Illinois, or I oh, heard yeah. in the Wall Street Journal, Illinois is eliminating their school choice program. And and New York City with the caps and things, so hopefully that'll improve. Yeah, and, and actually in Illinois, it's cowardice. So Illinois has this, uh, it's a choice scholarship. For, I mean, you know, it, throughout Illinois, you've got these cities like Decatur or Chicago where proficiency rates are literally in the single digits, right? Uh, but it's cowardice because they're not actually proactively canceling the program. They're just allowing it to expire at the end of the year. Right, so it's action through non-action. So no one actually has to have their fingerprints on ending a program which almost exclusively serves low-income kids, you know, but this is what's happening. And unless we as the populace like rise up and say this is wrong, there are folks who benefit from preserving the status quo. It's, it's uh, mind-boggling. The homeschooling, the, 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 some bright spots are, um, there is a, a vast increase in homeschooling. That is certainly on the rise. And there's also a, a rise in Catholic schools. So parents are, and, and some charter schools too. Um, so parents are saying, you know what? If the public system won't deliver schools that can work, we're gonna look for alternatives. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that's. A, I hope. I hope it does change because, again, for people who have the means to do it, 
you can move, but if you're in South Bronx, I mean, you're, you're in tough luck. Yeah, so. well, that's, yeah, and that's so. often, often the case, right? right? You talk about school choice. Well, school choice already exists if you're a middle or upper class um, uh, background. You could move to a nice suburb. Uh, I mean, my, I, you know, we personally, we used to, my wife and I, when we had our two children, we used to live in New York City. We were not happy with the options, and so we moved to a lovely town in Westchester, and, you know, and we pay now higher uh, property tax, but our kids have access to a pretty good um, public education system. And so I just want that same freedom that we're able to exercise in my own family for that to exist for any other kid, regardless of where they're growing up. Yeah. So, so I just want to ask you again, because you, you have the, we have the, the, the four cardinal virtues up here that, that you base your school on. And, mm. and I know that you, you are in a, an old Catholic school, and I had seen the picture where they're, they're on the steps, and I assumed <laughs> that those were just there, and that you kept, that that's why you adopted the oh, right, cardinal no. virtues, but could you just talk a little bit about why you adopted them and why you decided you yeah. thought it was important to define them as yeah. you did? Well, uh, so, you know, there, there's this word indoctrination that you often hear today, like, oh my God, you're indoctrinating kids, and it's, and it's usually, framed in a very negative, right? Like, what are you indoctrinating my kids in? And, and the thing is, that's sort of like one of those words that's kind of hijacked by certain, whatever your political stance may be. But the, but the truth is, any institution uh, here at NDSU or, or a school, any, any kind of school, if you have young people in your care, you are indoctrinating them whether intentionally or unintentionally, right? You, either by deliberate action or happenstance, you are teaching them something about the way that you want them to be in the world. So every institution indoctrinates, especially young people. And so we just said, well, what is it that we want to be intentional about what are the what are the rules of the road for us, and and as we thought about this question, we came to the cardinal virtues and this fact that as I said before, cardo is the root, hinge. You know these are the foundations upon all upon which all other uh, character-based strengths are built. We felt that seems like a that seems like a pretty good uh, foundation. So that's why we chose the virtues. And what's interesting. In 2022, when we opened in August of 2022, we just said our cardinal virtues are courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom, but we didn't define them. We said, you know, what does courage mean to you? You know, what does wisdom mean to you? What does temperance mean? And, you know, if you ask a question to a few hundred young people, you'll get a few thousand. Uh, different answers. And it just became clear to us that we actually had to be even more intentional about what we meant by that. So we created these, what we call I statements. Uh, because the idea is that we want our students over time, not just to memorize these, you know, to learn these words in their head, ultimately we want them to learn these in their heart. Right? That these are the ways that shape your attitude, your behavior. So courage, you know, I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. And so we live at a time where depending on your race, your gender, your background, there's a lot of narratives that either push this idea that you're either a victim or you're a victimizer, right? You're either oppressed or you're an oppressor, right? You're either marginalized or you're the one doing the marginalizing. And we fight very much against this idea that you're a victim, right? I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. And so at our assemblies, our students say these words. 
you know, justice. I uphold our common humanity and honor the inherent dignity of each individual. So it's not, you don't have value because you're black. You don't have value because, you know, you're um, a girl. You don't have value because you're trans. Like these are all groupings that we live in a society that people are ascribing value to either negative or positive, depending on the perspective that you're coming from. And we don't think of you as a group. You're not just like some representative. Uh, because you're a white male, you're inherently an oppressor. Because you're a black girl, you're inherently victimized. We honor the inherent dignity of each individual. And uh, these are, we feel that these are very powerful concepts that we want our students to absorb. Temperance, we talked about it before. I lead my life with self-discipline because I'm responsible for my learning and my behavior, right? I am responsible for my learning and behavior, right? Like, I've got to be the one that gets, I've got to study, you know, I've got to, I've got to do my homework. Doesn't mean that you're alone. It just means that you recognize that, you know, the motto for our school, there's, there are no victims in our school, only architects of their own lives. And we really are trying to build uh, that sentiment. In wisdom, I make sound judgments based on knowledge of objective universal truth. And we've been talking a lot about this, this last one, wisdom, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Because if you've seen, I don't know what's going on at NDSU, but at college campuses around the country, there are a lot of young people who are certain in their convictions, and they're protesting, and they're shouting out slogans. And frankly, I think a lot of young people have no idea what the slogans that they're shouting out even mean. And I'm referring now to the conflict between Israel and Hamas. And um, do, they, do they know the history of this particular region of the world? Can they articulate the position that they're screaming for? Can they articulate the position of the people who are opposed to that view? Um, and so we've been talking a lot about what's our response? Because there, you know, there's a lot of pressure right now for schools to make a statement about where you stand on this particular position. And we've said, you know what we need to do? We need to, we probably need to have a course or a course of study in comparative religion in high school. Like, do our kids know what Juda Judaism is? or Christianity, or Islam, or Buddhism? Like, is there even a basic understanding of these world religions where there is overlap and commonality and where there's conflict? You know, And so we want to set up a school where we are intentionally building a core body of knowledge so that our kids know that almost every issue has multiple perspectives. And that part of our job is helping you build the knowledge so that you can argue, you can come to your own belief on a given topic by understanding multiple perspectives around that topic. So we'll now, like a lot of our essays now, are going to be take a position on X, spend 600 words there, and then take a position 600 words on the opposite of X. And you've got to you've got to know as well. Um, your opponent's arguments as well as you understand your own. Um, so these virtues and these I statements govern almost every aspect of our school, from the curriculum, the canon, the books we choose, the reward ceremonies. I mean, for this Friday, we'll have a reward ceremony for our 10th graders, and we'll be honoring kids who demonstrate courage or demonstrate temperance. And so this is our effort to show that it's possible uh, to build an institution like this that we think ultimately leads to more kids having a sense of agency within their own lives. That's, that's awesome. And the, I had not heard the part about the teaching students civil discourse. I mean, I think that's really important. We, we did a survey of college students nationwide and found that oh, yes. students are not really open to different points of view. And so I'm, is that something that you normally encounter? I've actually at used a, your at, study. <laughs> okay. so, I mean, I think it's, it's not a college problem. From my understanding, it's, it develops much earlier. And is that well, something Well, like so many things that we, you know, 
whine about at college. It's like, well, if you're really interested in solving the college issue, how about in high school and middle school, we, we foster this idea of civil discourse and understanding your opponent's perspective? And how about this? Actually being knowledgeable <laughs> about a topic before you declare <laughs> your 100% certain position on that topic, and you're not even fully knowledgeable of what it is that you're talking about. And most importantly, you're not fully knowledgeable of what your opponent um, is talking about. And so, you know, so we'll do traditional things like debate, but, but we are really talking about how do we see, how do we have this idea seep in uh, to our schools, and, and we're, we're kind of digging this idea of every assignment will have some component of what's the perspective that you're arguing for and what's the perspective of the opposite. And we hope through that process, you know, a lot of folks talk about we need our schools to develop critical thinkers. Sure, but what is it that they're critically thinking about, yeah. <laughs> right? Like what, what knowledge base are we ensuring we're exposing to our kids so that they can step back and have the proper perspective. Um, you know, so we, so it, this isn't easy, right? Because the tendency for grown-ups is to say, you know, we have the answer. We know where, you know, we know who the villains are and the heroes are in this current conflict, and we gotta make sure we tell our kids this. So there's temperance, you know, this idea of self-discipline these cardinal virtues apply to the adults as well, right? So we have to practice constraint, um, even in terms of our own imposing uh, our view. So we're actually working on, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the Chicago statement of uh, freedom of expression, University of Chicago, um, basically, probably about, I think it's from, 20, 30 years maybe, maybe not that old. But it's a statement that Chicago has set as a standard where they as an institution try to foster an environment where they're not imposing their view onto kids and, and you know, trying to create an environment where young people um, can have freedom of expression. And that statement combined with something called the Calvin Report, yeah. uh, which is something that insists on institutional neutrality um, we're, we're, comp we're creating something that we think will be pretty unique for a high school for how we create an environment on our campus where we both impart knowledge but from the perspective of multiple perspectives so that our, our students can develop their own beliefs on given issues. Yeah, I, I hope we can develop those here too. I was at a fire conference and I'm very ah. interested in both of those things. Oh. Um, but but I, I also want to... So I, I, we promise that like a half an hour worth of time for the oh audience. Gosh, so I yeah, want to yeah. make sure we get into yes, a couple yes. other things. So one thing I want to ask you about is a lot of what you study is family formation as well. And so you've shown that, you know, there's a lot, very important, uh, a lot of importance on having two married parents mm. in terms of child, childhood poverty uh, reduction and in terms of childhood success. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the evidence regarding yeah. having two married parents? Yeah, and, and like with most things, a lot of this uh, started with a personal experience. So I was running uh, public prep, this network of uh, public charter schools from 2010 to 2020. And in 2016, you know, we had, as I was saying earlier, we had this overwhelming demand um, in which every year we had nearly 5,000 kids on our wait list, especially for our schools in the Bronx. And as we were doing our strategic planning for opening new schools, we made the decision that all of our new schools would be in the South Bronx, just given the, the level of demand that we had. And so we moved our headquarters from Tribeca in Manhattan, uh, which is on West Broadway, you know, very she-she, very cool uh, area of Manhattan. We moved from there to 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in the South Bronx, which is a very different uh, community. Like we literally had a needle exchange on the corner. So there were addicts, you know, walking by our front door every day. But that's where kids were, you know, that, that's where 
Uh, we needed to open great schools in that neighborhood, so why not move our headquarters there? So, um, and so in order to help our staff get to know the neighborhood, we did a walking tour. Um, you know, where's the local bodega? Where's the local bank? Uh, where's the local deli? And so as we're walking as a group, uh, in the distance, I see this crowd of people, mostly adults, excited. Uh, uh, and they were standing around this 27-foot baby blue Winnebago truck. And they were all excited. It's, it was similar to seeing the ice cream truck when little kids are, are there. Like, they're, they're all excited. I'm like, what is this truck that all these adults are seeing as, as they're excited? And as we get closer, we see that there's graffiti lettering on the side of the truck. And the graffiti lettering says, who's your daddy? Like, what's that? Well, it turns out that the Who's Your Daddy truck, which is very well known in the Bronx, is a mobile DNA testing center where low-income folks were spending somewhere between $350 and $500 to take DNA tests to answer questions like, you know, you know could you be my sister? You know, are you my father? Like, profound questions around identity. And, uh, and you know, I learned that the, the, the Who's Your Daddy truck was so popular that the, the, the entrepreneur, Jared Rosenthal, had um, bought a second truck that was now traveling not only around New York City, but to Washington, D.C., Chicago, Baltimore, because these services were so needed. You know, the non-marital birth rate in this uh, area of the Bronx was 84%. And uh, as I started doing more research, and you know, I was running, I had been running schools now in the South Bronx, so it's not that I wasn't aware that a lot of our kids came from unstable family households, but there was something about the normalcy of that truck, the celebration of it, that just hit me in a very different way. Like running great schools, necessary, but not sufficient. And that we had to do something to help our kids think differently about the decisions that they were going to make going forward, particularly around their own decisions to forming their own families. And, uh, and that led me on a whole different path um, that we now teach in our schools, something called, something called the success sequence. Everyone ever hear that terminology? A couple of people. So success sequence is just a fancy uh, title for data that says if a high school student finishes um, even just high school, not even a college degree, but they finish high school, um, then get a full-time job of any kind just so they learn the dignity and discipline of work, and then if they have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials who follow that series of decisions, education, work, marriage, then children, 97% avoid poverty. And the vast majority enter the middle class or beyond. Now, it's not 100%, right? And I will say that we have lots of single moms that go to our schools that would do anything for their children to be successful. And I certainly know many kids of married, stable, two-parent households who are not successful. So there's no, there's no automatic uh, outcome but you are delusional if you don't recognize the massive difference in likelihood of life success of being raised in married two-parent households versus uh, single-parent households. And so we teach this content in our schools. And we teach it in what we call a descriptive fashion, not prescriptive. Meaning we don't say, you must follow these outcomes. Because in, the, in our class, Pathways to Power, we say, like, if you follow this series of decisions, there's a 97% probability of avoidance of poverty. Here's another set of decisions where there's a 50% probability of avoidance of poverty. Here's another set of decisions which you know, have their own sets of outcomes, but ultimately you're the architect of your own life, right? Um, you decide, and so this topic of family structure 
is fundamental. If you're serious about the topic of upward mobility or improving education, and you're not squarely talking about family structure, then you're not serious. You're not, because you're not honestly confronting one of the biggest factors that is driving sort of the foundational elements that shape most of what a kid has the capacity to do. That doesn't mean schools are off the hook and all the things that we need to do to be exceptional, but family structure is fundamental. And the good news is that uh, there's an economist, Melissa Kearney, uh, who's just written a book called uh, The Two-Parent Privilege. And in this book, she goes into detail about the um, clear benefit to kids of, uh, of positive outcomes being raised in a married two-parent household on dimensions of better educational outcomes, um, less interaction with the criminal justice system, much lower levels of generation, intergenerational poverty. Uh, and so she is typically viewed as more progressive, more on the left, and so the fact that she's written this book is kind of a watershed moment, because maybe we've gotten to a point where there's consensus on both the left and the right that family structure actually matters, and we don't have to debate that issue anymore. Now it's just debating how do we create more uh, opportunities for young people to be born and raised in married to parent households. So it's an extremely important uh, topic, and I spend a lot of time writing about that. Uh, as much as I run schools, uh, talking about family structure and you know, my framework is free, family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, I also talk a lot about the role of faith. Um, it's, an, it's a topic that's almost become taboo in our country, but for young people who have a personal faith commitment in their life, dramatically different uh, numbers or incidents of isolation, depression, alienation, loneliness, um, uh, you know, relative to kids who don't. And that's why you see so much, you, you talk so much about the, the mental health crisis uh, amongst young people today. Well, a lot of that is a, is a result of the de decline of religious faith uh, in our community. So that's another lever that I want more and more young people to know could be a great source of power uh, within their own lives. Yeah, and I, I read about that in your book where you, I think it was a quote from G.K. Chesterton where he said uh, something like, people who don't have a religious belief don't believe in nothing, they'll believe in almost anything or so, something to that They extent. will believe in almost anything. That void will be filled. You know, John McWhorter has a great book called Woke Racism, where he basically calls woke ideology a new religion. Like, it, it, it has its, you know, basic moral tenets. You can be excommunicated if you don't believe the right thing. So um, not believing in organized religion is, is not usually a, a static situation. It's filled with something else. And that something else isn't necessarily the best to help you as a young person know what your moral framework should be around decision making. Yeah, so I just have one last question before we turn it over yeah. to the audience. And so I just wanted to ask you just as a follow-up, uh, so you had mentioned again the, the importance of family structure and poverty and upward mobility, um, but you also note that many databases or most databases that track childhood success do not keep track of marital status of parents. So I just looked it up yesterday looking at the nation's report card and they include race, gender, education level of parents, uh, region where they live, but nothing about the marital status of their parents. Is, that, is there going to be, do you think, oh. you said if there's an acceptance by both sides <laughs> that this is important, do you think they'll start including that in, in well, databases? Well, so, so John is raising a really, really uh, powerful point. Because if you look at, and this is true in education, crime, uh, healthcare, if you look at most social indicators, they're a set of uh, what I call usual suspect categories, right? You'll see, you'll see education data disaggregated by race, you'll see it disaggregated by um, economic level or class, maybe you'll see uh, parental income, um, 
but you'll almost never see distinctions based on, well, what are the academic outcomes of kids being raised in married two-parent households versus kids raised by single parents versus kids raised by grandparents. Like you almost never see that data. And it's a huge uh, loss because what it means is if, you, if you're constantly seeing data um, disaggregated by race, for example, you will, it, that you will tend to believe that the reason that you see disparities is because of race, right? Ibram Kendi, who wrote uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist and recently identified as being somewhat fraudulent, um, is famous for saying, when I see uh, racial disparities, I see racism, full stop. There is no other explanation. And so in the absence of data that would show you that actually there's a factor that's far more transcendent maybe that would lead you to different sets of interventions. Let me give, let me give you one example. Um, you often hear about the racial wealth gap, right? Uh, so the 2019 survey of consumer finances shows very starkly that the median wealth of the average white family is about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average black family. And for some people, that's the end of story. That's the proof of America's both historic discrimination and present day discrimination. And it's there, it is true. Like, <laughs> it is in the, that same survey. But if you look at that same 2019 survey of consumer finances, and you take into account just two factors, education level and family structure, the outcomes are dramatically different. It turns out that the median wealth of the average black married, college educated family is about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average white single parent family. What that data shows is perhaps in a, trying to explain a disparity, there are other factors, in this case, uh, family structure and education, I won't even talk about age, I mean age alone explains a, a lot of these um, disparities. Um, and so if you know that family structure and education are far more determinative than a factor like race, then the sets of solutions that you start to build will be around things like strengthening family structure, increasing educational opportunity. But if you have what I call a monocausal view, meaning that you've got a silver bullet uh, answer to why disparities exist, then that inherently narrows what your solution set is. And so my hope is that, you know, I'm trying to work with <laughs> Nate in all sectors, that disaggregating outcomes by family structure becomes as normal as when you look at disaggregating outcomes by race, economic class, and all the usual suspects. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. So is there, okay. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm uh, Professor James Caton, and I'll be leading a reading group tomorrow where we're actually discussing a couple times a semester um, education and views on education. And you said something that really struck me was that there's this view of education, edu educational institutions as being necessary and sufficient. But, but not sufficient. No, well, I, so I'm, I wanna turn that on its head and, okay. and so, ask you about this is that there, this means that there's a view that having educational institutions is itself s sufficient. You're arguing against that. But, um, and this seems to be very problematic. I'm a, I'm a father, I do have kids in school, and I know that um, despite their being there, um, much of the education that they're getting is actually when they're at home and there's conflict, I sort of stand back but do my best to guide mediation. Um, when they're at home and they're interested in something, I wanna be encouraging. I want to help shape their disposition. 
Um, and a lot of these things that, that you're talking about actually are rooted in the family unit, right? And so by everything that you're saying is just ringing so true that if we're looking at the wrong indicators, then we get this idea, and this is what I'd like you to comment on, um, education is necessary and sufficient and more is better. Um, can you comment on the sorts of distortions that that view can create when we're not actually being careful about understanding the totality of education, yeah. the disposition of education? Yeah, required? so um, if you were to do a time study on how a kid spends their time over the course of the first you know, uh, 17 years of their life, you would actually discover that it's actually a relatively small percent of your time is actually spent in school, right? Because the first zero to five is you're not in formal schooling. When schooling begins, you know, you're you know, 8 a.m. to maybe 3 p.m., but that means most of your day is at home or asleep. And so you actually start to realize uh, school is important, but it, it actually pr provides uh, a, a minority of the guidance um, uh, in terms of how a kid shapes who they are. And so the obvious question are, well, what are the other entities that are influencing a child's development? And that's where family structure, especially for the first five years of life, is dominant. Um, so when I say education is necessary but not sufficient, I'm trying to recognize the role of family, the role of faith. Um, look, the more education, the better, for sure, if it's, especially if it's a good education. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, there's schools I, I want to just take kids out because I don't think they're getting the right kind of, um, you know, learning. Um, they're learning the wrong things. So, um, yeah, I guess I would just say that, uh, the, so in, in my book I write about uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who is a, um, a sociologist at uh, Cornell, and he developed something called the, the bioecological model of human development. And if you think about it visually, it's a series of concentric circles, where at the center is a child, and what radiates around the child are the forces that have influence or not over that child. So at the center, if you look at his model, there's the kid, and there's the parent, uh, there's siblings, um, you radiate out a little bit, and then there's schools, um, there's churches, there's local nonprofit organizations, and if you radiate out a little bit more, there's the neighborhood, there's the police, and you radiate out a little bit more. There's government policy. If you radiate out a little bit more, there's like media. And so you, it, it visually, it's kind of simple, but you kind of get this idea that there are all sorts of forces interacting with a kid's development, right? And the stronger the core, the stronger the ability to kind of keep out all these other forces, but the weaker the core, the weaker the family structure, that's where lots of other values or habits or attitudes can penetrate. And so I'm a school leader who obviously stands for great schools, but I'm fully aware that we only have our kids over the course of you know, zero to 17 years, a relatively small amount of time, which is why in our schools, we are trying to educate about the importance of family, the importance of faith, so that you know, our hope is that our, our students uh, develop a sense of what does it mean to lead a complete life? Like, like we don't have to, like if, if in New York State, we don't have to have cardinal virtues, right? We could just have a school system that's purely focused on math, reading, science, and we could provide a, you know, hopefully a solid education, a, a solid knowledge-based education. We're deciding that there's something about virtue that we're also trying to do. Now, 
it could have been 100 years ago that may or may not have been necessary for us to do this because the strength of family or the strength of faith-based organizations in a way was already providing that to our schools. We just can't make that assumption anymore. And so I don't know if that's answering your question, but that, that, that's a sense of why we're choosing to do what we're doing. You mentioned Illinois, and it seems like the problem of monopolization shows up with this exactly this problem. Um, and so maybe, and I don't know if you want to respond to this, but the, the issue then is something like you have an institution, you have the shell of this thing that's supposed to provide education, but it's been monopolized, and it's, it's believed that thing will actually provide a service that uh, maybe fundamentally for many it cannot. Yeah. Um, th this seems to be behind. Uh, the, the problem that I was asking about. Right, I think what you just said is the, the sort of monopolization of schools. Um, and you know, I try not to get into the sort of all the market forces of public education. However, it is true, if you're a mom, you're in the South Bronx, you're 22 years old, you know, you had a kid at 17, whatever decisions you may have made in your own life, you want your kid to have a shot, right? You want, you, want, you want her to have a shot. And if the only option that you have is to send your now five-year-old to a school that for generations, only 7% of kids are coming out of that school able to read and write or do math at grade level, then that's a problem. That's the, that is a problem with monopoly and lack of choice, so I, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, sometimes people hate using these sort of business terms for public for a public good, but it's kind of true. Um, and to the degree that we can help more young people and families have choice within this monopolistic system, I think that's better. Um, hi, my name's Patrick McCluskey. Um, I is, work is in that mic on? Is it on? Hello? There you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, mine's Patrick McCluskey. I work in the chancellor's office uh, in the North, North Dakota State University. Um, and I wanted to thank you for coming out here, for starting, and also for all the work you do. Um, I know those streets very, very well. I spent years walking them in the South Bronx in Harlem. I wrote a book about another high school in, in the middle of Harlem. It was an all-boys high school. And I can attest to um, that this does work, this approach does work, uh, because it, I don't think they did it quite as well as what you're proposing to do, but they did a darn good job. Everybody graduated in four years, and it was based on basic skills, education, uh, and, and morality, and it all works really, really well together. Um, I have two things I'd like to add, have you talk about. One is charter schools in a little more detail, because there are no charter schools in North Dakota, so people are not necessarily aware of um, how they work and what they are. Um, also, that they can they can um, fail miserably if if they don't approach it uh, the right way. In fact, you know, other any charter schools that I have visited, like um, Achievement First in Hartford, they do a version of what we're talking about here. They're the ones that succeed. There's others that do a sort of light version of what's already going on in the public school, and it, it fails miserably. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, and you can comment on, is that um, we talked about the low achievement rate in inner city neighborhoods, but it wasn't always so. Um, when I was in Harlem, it was ni the 19, late 1990s, 2000s, and one of the things that struck me in talking to people, the older people, was the fact that, um, that the demise of public education was not what they had experienced growing up, that the public education in the black neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods, was actually quite good. Um, in fact, I'm sure y you know the story of Dunbar High School that Thomas right. Sowell has written about in, in Washington, D.C. was an academic school that competed with the best schools in the country mm -hmm. and did quite well. In fact, it probably graduated more students with into, into college and that eventually got degrees than any high school in the country, and, and then it fell apart in the late 50s. Um, the same with family structure in Harlem in the 1930s. Uh, the uh, the uh, marriage rate was actually higher than the white community. Mm -hmm. 
So there's been a breakdown that, that I mean, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan started writing about. But I want, you know, people should be aware that it wasn't always this way, and that, it, that putting it back together is more going back towards the norm than right. achieving something um, supernatural. <laughs> right. Right? Yep. Uh, please. Uh, no, no, so, uh, so I, I'm 100% in agreement. So if you weren't able to hear, you know, th this is the powerful point. You know, we, we've become so used to this idea that, you know, single-digit percentages of kids, particularly low-income black and Hispanic kids, are reading at grade level. It wasn't always this way. Uh, or that, you know, the non-marital birth rate uh, is 70, 80 percent. It wasn't always this way. I mean, there was a time in the early 1900s that the, the marriage rate in the black community was the highest in the country higher than that of, of, of whites. And in general, the non-marital birth rate was in single digits for everybody. And uh, it was in the 1960s that uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote a study, it was at the Department of Labor, about the black family. And, that, and this was 1966, I think. Um, when he said there is a crisis in a segment of the black community that had sort of entrenched poverty, uh, social dysfunction, and he basically said he was calling the alarms because the non-marital birth rate in the black community at that time was 23.6%. Like crisis, crisis, crisis. We need to get a handle on this. We need to get a handle on this. Well, fast forward 60 years, and the non-marital birth rate in the black community is now 70%, and it's about 30% in the white community, higher than the crisis levels that he was bringing attention to in the mid-1960s. And there's no question that that rate of family decline absolutely contributes to why our outcomes in academics and so many other areas has also, has also gone down precipitously. So it's a big point to make to a lot of the skeptics who are saying, well, it's because of you know, slavery, it's because of this, it's because of all these reasons why we're not successful today. Well, if that's the case, then why was it that many communities were far more successful post-slavery, you know, um, in the early 1900s, and yet uh, things have declined since then. So it's a very, very important point that, you know, we also try in our school to um, make this point known, that our communities have not always been uh, this way, and you have the power to strengthen your community. You don't have to leave. You can strengthen it um, here. So that's, so that's, thank you for raising that. And in terms of uh, public charter schools, uh, I don't know why actually North Dakota doesn't have, it, it seems like you should. <laughs> um, yeah. It seems that, uh, I mean, for those that aren't familiar, public charter schools, first of all, are public schools. That's a, what's that? Well, there are, there are rural, there are charter, public charter schools in rural uh, communities, but yeah, it does present different challenges. Like in New York City, you could have four charter schools in like a one-mile radius because it's so dense. Uh, you could have four elementary schools to choose from, and that's the beautiful thing, you know. And then these schools have to be good, you know, to to attract um, uh, students. So uh, I would encourage the legislature <laughs> in in North Dakota to. Um, you know, I mean, yes, so the, the rural challenges, but in a place like Fargo, I would imagine, um, you know, are all the schools that a parent has the, you know, that they're obligated to send their kid to, are those uh, good schools, and would they benefit? I would imagine there are people who are middle um, class or upper income folks in North Dakota who are choosing to send their kid to a religious school or a better private school, right? Why should they have that opportunity? And, the, and yet the most vulnerable 
kids in our society don't have the same choice. That's the argument I always use to anyone who opposes school choice, who, by the way, often are choosing to send their kids yeah. <laughs> exactly. to uh, a school that's outside of their you know, mandated zone. Yeah, I was just looking for clarification on one of the virtues, courage. Can you, can you um, hold it to your mic? OK. Um, yeah, I was just looking for clarification on one of the virtues, courage. Um, I was wondering, how do you reject victimhood while still acknowledging and embracing feelings? So I didn't hear the last. How do you reject victimhood while acknowledging and embracing your feelings. feelings. While embracing feelings. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things I, um, one of the things I write about, I guess, in the book is Martin Luther King and this idea that um, he was able to create a movement where people were obviously being victimized, right? But something that he always uh, stressed is that even though you're being victimized, you don't have to take on a victim mindset. And so I, I think that's my answer to your question, which is life is a series of challenges, <laughs> you know? Sometimes those challenges may be because you're, you're of a certain race, you're of a certain background, you're too short, you're too tall, you're, you're, there's all sorts of reasons that you're gonna face um, hurdles in which you might become the victim. But the thing that we're trying to instill in our kids is this idea that there's always a sense of agency. Like one of our, um, one of our required readings that our students will be reading is uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Any folks know that book? All right, for those of you that you aren't, read that book. <laughs> um, because it's pretty powerful. It's about his time um, in a concentration camp where he's talking about even in, I mean, horrific, horrific conditions he writes about the fact there are these external stimuli that you cannot control. Like people can be um, practicing evil all around you, but the one thing you control is your response to that external stimuli. And in that moment, in that decision, in that moment of choice is this idea of agency, that you don't have to take on a victim mindset. So I, if I think I'm understanding your question, how do you simultaneously reject victimhood while still having true and honest feelings is this idea that you aren't inherently, whatever the, the problem is or whatever you think you're being victimized, it's, it's not on you or you, you have within you the tools of self-renewal, the tools of self-betterment. Um, and you know, there it is, like that's, that's it. And if you can hold on to that, you can endure, you can overcome. That's what we want to, that's what we want to instill. I'd like to ask you a question. You talk about the importance of family. I'm assuming your grandparents probably weren't around you when you were growing up as a result of them being baby and you were there. Who influenced you outside of your personal parents? Um, so my grandmother was my, on my mom's side. Um, we actually just had our family reunion in Jamaica a couple weeks ago, where we went back to our grandparents' house, and it was it was actually quite emotional to look at our entire family to see who had who had come from these two very humble people um, in the country in Jamaica. Um, so who else influenced me? Um, um, 
I mean, I, you know, I played baseball. I mean, I had dreams of, uh, you know, playing for the Cincinnati Reds for some reason. Um, and I was pretty good at baseball. So my coaches were um, big influences. But the, but the truth is, no one was more influential than my parents. You know, my dad, uh, you know, often used to say, when he was in Jamaica, he said, you know, I was a man. I was a man. Um, it wasn't until he came to the United States that he was told over and over and over again that you're a black man. You're a black man. Um, and that had meaning in the sense of, well, you're a black man, which means that somehow you're, a, you're slightly less than or you have less opportunity or you're less capable. And he just rejected all of that. He just, like, that's madness. That's crazy. Why would you believe that? And, um, and that's, like, that, I mean, I, I'm sharing the story with you now because it was something growing up that was really important. I don't want any kid, regardless of any superficial characteristic, to believe in their minds that they're somehow less than, that they're a victim of some kind, that, that they're a victim of a, of a characteristic that they have no control over. So, I'd have to go back to my, my parents still as my primary anchors. So, so we made a mistake in uh, this series. We, we should have made this three hours. Cause like, <laughs> <laughs> I have, yeah, I mean, so I, there's one question I want to ask you, but I do want to make one, one comment. I mean, I think that what you just said is, is very important. You talked about how when we think about um, a single cause for disparities, that it causes us not to look for other solutions, but you also in your book, and I'll, I'll just give people a teaser, there's some very, I think, very heartbreaking stories about kids that are sent this message as well and believe that they can't achieve their yep. dreams because they're being told that you can't because, yep. you know, because of your characteristics, you cannot achieve yep. certain things, and that's a really bad message to send to kids. And, but anyway, I want to ask you last question. Um, and so this is a question that we ask for all, all of our speakers is, do you have some advice that you could give to our students? It's a chance for our students to hear from successful people like you. What can they do to enhance their chances for future success? Hmm. Um, well, I think the thing to, um, always recognize is that you're not alone, that there are individuals who are just like you, um, some of which have been wildly successful in their lives, however they define success, and there are others that have not been successful. Um, and like I've spent 30 years of my life working with young people of every kind of background, you know, rich kids, poor kids, white kids, black kids, Asian kids, Hispanic kids, um, you know, kids in homeless shelters, uh, foster care, like just kids from every background. And, uh, and over the course of my 30 years, I've now been doing this work long enough where I've seen young people being raised in some pretty challenging conditions, you know, domestic violence, abuse, neglect. And as they've made their decisions to enter young adulthood, sometimes the decisions that they make recreate those same conditions for the next generation, right? But I've also seen kids in those same exact conditions. Conditions that someone would say, oh my gosh, that kid is lost. You know, they're from neighborhood XYZ. You know, their parents are ABC. They're never going to get out. You know? And yet, those kids make different sets of decisions that allow them to break the cycle of disadvantage, right? They're not on this kind of entrenched, perpetual life of deprivation. And so the animating question for my life 
has been what makes the difference? What makes the difference between those kids who were born and raised in certain situations where they just recreate that same phenomenon or they break? And in my observation, and this is my advice to young people and why I've written a book called Agency, is that the young people who've been able to break the cycle of disadvantage typically had a sense of personal agency in their own lives, that they recognized that they had free will, but that free will was actually guardrailed in a sense. And in my experience, these young people had four institutions that they associated with their life. The first being family. Regardless of the family that they were from, the family that they were on the pathway to form made all the difference, right? So regardless of you came from a really tough situation, you typically were following the success sequence or you know, adhering to this idea that the family I'm gonna form is very different than the family that I came from. That's you know, my observation. Typically, they were on that kind of pathway. The second observation I've observed is that young people able to break the cycle of disadvantage usually had some kind of personal faith commitment in their own life. You know, they lived by a moral code, usually informed by some kind of organized religion. Whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, almost didn't matter, but they were part of a community of people that expected them to live up to this moral code. So when you face these moments of inevitable challenges, you have something to fall back on, which gives you a sense of right versus wrong. The third observation is that you know, kids who are able to break the cycle of disadvantage as they entered young adulthood is that they typically benefited from some kind of educational freedom or school choice. They went to a good schools. And usually, if you had those three elements, you were on a pathway to form a strong family, you have a um, personal faith commitment, you benefited from educational freedom, that usually meant that uh, you had what I call an entrepreneurial spirit. You're a problem solver in your own life. So that when hurdles come, you don't just shrink back or have no rudder for which to make decisions. You're part of a community of people that love you, that have your back. Um, so that would be my advice, to, to recognize that leading a life of agency meaning, means meeting a life, a self-determined life of meaning and purpose, and that there are institutions that can help you get there. And those institutions, in my view, are the family that you're on the pathway to form, a personal faith commitment, strong education, and uh, that's what I'd say. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. So, anyone that wants your book autographed, I think. Oh my right, gosh! I, yes. I'm volunteering yes. you. <laughs> I know. I, I want yeah. mine autographed. So. All right. Okay. No worries. No worries. Oh. Hi. Should you, should you capitalize truth in that last one? Should I capitalize truth? Should well, we? you, you know, at That's one time, no, at one time, uh, they wanted to add an S 